Do you remember your first love? I bet you do. Mine was Julia, and she was hot. She had long legs, runner's build, stretching all the way down to these long, elegant toes painted red like cherry lollipops. She had long, luscious black hair. You can still smell it. And long, sophisticated fingers. Fingers that stroked the strings of her violin when she played Beethoven for me. Fingers that penned intense love poems that she bound into illustrated books and gave me for birthdays and anniversaries. Fingers that gripped the shaft of her exacto blade as she etched the lines of linoleum cuts and fingers that were skilled in other arts as well. Uh, we met in the summer of 1985 on the green lawn of Yale's Cross campus when her frisbee landed at my feet. I bent down to pick it up and as I rose, I fell into these enormous, beautiful blue eyes, the color of the Caribbean. And I just stood there staring. And she said, hey, you gonna give me my Frisbee? And I said, no, I'll give you your Frisbee if you tell me your name. Now, you can laugh and say that was not the greatest pickup line in the world, but it worked. And we ended up dating for about three years. We had a lot in common. We were both juniors. I was between my junior and senior year of college working in New Haven. And she was between her junior and senior year of high school. Yes, you heard me. <laughs> high school uh, at a Yale summer program. But you know, we were two mature adults, so we weren't gonna let something like four years of age difference get in the way. Now, I remember the first time I fooled around with Julia. And the thing about fooling around is you never remember the actual fooling around as much as you'd like to. You only remember everything around the fooling around. So what I remember is this beige green carpet that we rolled onto off the mattress on my floor. And I remember the late afternoon light filtering in through the window as it began to grow dark and Julia said, I have to go now, but then didn't go. And I remember this sheer gauze curtain left there by some previous tenant fluttering in the perfect summer breeze, the way our hearts were fluttering against each other as we pressed together. I also remember the first time she stayed over in that apartment I was sharing with my roommates and New Haven on Olive Street, and we hadn't planned on it, so she didn't have any contact lens solution, and we improvised. We put her contacts in a pot of water to boil on the stove and went into the bedroom, and just as things started to get hot, <coughs> the smoke alarm goes off. We run into the kitchen half naked, and we find her contacts melted in the bottom of the pot. So she put on her glasses, and we went back into the bedroom, and I found myself imagining a different bedroom in a different house and the two of us lying together in bed surrounded by all our favorite books. Now for the next two and a half years of the relationship you have to go on fast forward because we lived on fast forward. This was a long distance relationship before Facebook, Skype, email, cell phones, chat, all the ways that people can communicate with each other now for free. Just think enormous long distance phone bills. <laughs> And we rarely saw each other for more than about 48 hours at a stretch. And there are only so many things you can do in 48 hours, and only so many times you can do it even when you're in your 20s. <laughs> so um, life during those two and a half years was a series of magical moments for us, of, of me creeping up the stairs from her bedroom in the basement of her parents' house at 5 a.m. so they wouldn't know that I had slept down there with her. Or uh, this magical, mind-blowing, out-of-body experience on the couch in my mother's family room in Chicago, or reading Rilke together on the bottom bunk of her parents' vacation home in Martha's Vineyard. But these magical moments were always ending. One of us always had to pack up and go home, so we always had to pull that rabbit out of the hat too soon. We craved a stretch of uninterrupted time together so we could just be with each other. And we finally got it in the summer of 1988, when I convinced Julia's father, who was a college professor, that the best thing for her education would be to spend the entire summer living with me in my apartment in Chicago. <laughs> and he agreed. <laughs> so I remember speeding to the airport in my little gold Toyota Corolla with the pop-up headlights and my heart racing faster than the engine. And I remember getting to the airport and 
seeing her get off the plane, you could actually do that then, and uh, my heart leaping out to greet her as she came out of the, the door, and then driving back into the city with her and just looking at each other, smiling, so happy, finally getting to my apartment, flopping down on my futon with a purple and green reversible comforter and just looking at each other and saying, ah. So the summer of 1988 was, and probably still is, the hottest summer on record in Chicago. We had 40 straight days over 80 degrees. And I think that first week we took it up over 100. We did not get out of bed. <laughs> The only times we got out of bed were to go to the bathroom or when I went to the freezer to take out the sheets because it was so hot. I put the sheets in the freezer. We just wanted to feel something cool against our skin for like five seconds. So, you know, and we, we talked about all the things we were going to do together, the walks by Lake Michigan and picnics in Lincoln Park and collaborating on a short film and it was bliss. And then one night the phone rang it was her father calling with some shocking news. Julia's best friend from high school, Michelle, had been killed in a car accident at the age of 20. So the next morning I was putting her on a plane back to New York so she could attend Michelle's funeral. And I remember giving her a big hug and saying, I can't wait till you get back. But the girl who came back was not the same girl who left. The Julia who was always so bright and bubbly was sad and silent, and the Julia who was always all over me in bed was suddenly shy and withdrawn. I tried to comfort her, but it was an immature kind of comfort. It was the kind that wants to make the problem go away and wants something in return. But God, I was frustrated. I was damned if, you know, her sadness or her dead friend or anything was going to get in the way of our season in the sun. But as the summer, hot summer wore on, our relationship cooled and my resentment fused with her grief to form an icicle that went right through the heart of the relationship. So by the time she had to go, we'd agreed that when she went back to college in the fall, she could date other people. And uh, I hoped she wouldn't take me up on it, but she did. And uh, she got serious enough about one guy that I gave her an ultimatum. I said, look, 48 hours, you choose him or me. And I remember spending those two days in the Biograph Theater around the corner from my apartment watching movies morning until night because I couldn't bear to think about her choosing. And I couldn't fathom that anybody's heart could have more love for her in it than mine. Well, eventually she did choose, and uh, I found myself in the backyard of her parents' home, dressed up in my white pants and blue button-down shirt, nice striped tie, blue blazer, penny loafers, polished to a high shine. I actually put dimes in my penny loafers. It was kind of tacky, but you know. And, uh, and there I was shaking hands with the man who would become her husband. And I remember her art teacher, Millie, this older lady, coming over to me and sort of leaning in conspiratorially and saying, I was always rooting for you. I don't know what happened. <laughs> so what happened was Julia got married and I got married and the woman I married was kind of jealous and she actually demanded that I cut off all contact with Julia shortly after our wedding and sadly, I did. 20 years later, she found me. She started reading my blog and she reached out to me and we reconnected. We've actually become uh, good friends, uh, really good friends. In fact, you might even say like Rick and Louis, the end of Casablanca, this is the start of a beautiful friendship. But unlike Rick at the end of that movie and unlike the boy I was then who gave her this big hug and said, I can't wait till you get back. The man I am today, the man I am today would have gotten on that plane. Thank you.